Thank you, Charlie, and thank you for those kind remarks, and uh, thank you to uh, the Committee for Economic Development, the New America Foundation, and Better Healthcare together to, for pulling together this fabulous day today and helping have a, a really important conversation on a, on a major issue facing our country. As you've heard from the speakers today at lunch, and for those of you who were with us earlier today, uh, the high cost of health care is a huge challenge to America's competitiveness, and it's all the more urgent in light of the current economic turmoil the country is facing. I've been asked today to share with you the findings from a new report from the McKinsey Global Institute that analyzes the costs of health care in the U.S. and the forces that drive them. This report is intended to be an aid as a fact base for policy discussions on the costs of health care rather than advocating for particular solutions. I will, however, conclude with some principles that I think would be helpful in light of those costs for how we might rein in some of these costs. But before I introduce the report itself, I'd like to throw four facts at you that lie, might provide some context about how we Americans are thinking about what we spend on health care. If you remember nothing else from today and my short talk, remember these four numbers. $2.1 trillion. In 2006, the U.S. spent $2.1 trillion on health care. That is more than China's citizens consumed on all goods and services in the same year. We spend more in health care in the United States than China spends in total. It's three times the size of the TARP package. Second, 50 to 70 percent of incremental state taxes. That's how much the average state is going to see going to Medicaid in the next three years, best case. It leaves less than half of state revenues for everything else that they do, education, transportation, public safety, and everything else. Third, a growth rate for costs. In every year bar one in the last two decades, employer-funded health insurance premiums have grown faster than inflation and faster than increases in workers' earnings. And finally, $400 billion. Between 2003 and 2006, health care spending grew, grew by nearly $400 billion. Just that growth is more than Americans spent on oil and gas in 2006 when energy prices began to reach two new highs. Again, that's a $2.1 trillion check a year, growing more than $200 billion a year, faster than inflation and workers' earnings, and more than half of every incremental state tax dollar. Now, I'm going to try and explain a little bit about how we got here. The U.S. spends more of its wealth on health care than any other developing country, and that share is rising. To benchmark costs across countries and spending categories, we developed a measure we call estimated spending according to wealth, which compares data from 13 OECD nations and adjusts health care spending according to GDP per capita. This measure is anchored in the fact that countries spend more on health care as their prosperity increases, just as you might buy a bigger home or one in better neighborhoods as your income rises. So what did we find? When we looked at how the U.S. health care spending compares to what you'd expect given the wealth that I just described and compared it to the 13, 13 OECD countries that were comparable, perhaps the most striking number of all is that the U.S. spends nearly $650 billion a year more in health care than is expected, even when adjusting for relative wealth. Or put another way, the $650 billion spending gap represents a 45 percent premium on what we would expect to see spent on health care given the United States wealth. Now this might be fine if the U.S. made a decision that it wanted to spend the extra $650 billion in order to get extra value. But it's not clear we obtain any extra value. I'm being polite. Parts of the U.S. health care system, such as its best hospital, some of whom are here today, are clearly world class. Cutting edge drugs and treatments are available earlier here and waiting times to see physicians tend to be lower. Yet our country lags other OECD members on a number of outcome measures, including life expectancy and infant mortality. Furthermore, access to health care is unequal. It's well known that more than 45 million Americans, or more than 16 percent of the population, lack insurance and the number's growing. 
Now, some people argue that higher health care spending is a consequence of demand, that Americans are sicker than people in other OECD countries. Well, that is also not true. While it is the case that lifestyle-induced diseases, which is a euphemism for bad behavior, such as uh, obesity, are on the rise in the United States, the most common diseases are, on average, slightly less prevalent in the United States than in pure OECD countries. The factors contributing to the lower disease rates include the relatively younger and therefore less disease-prone population, as well as the low prevalence of smoking-related problems. Even when considering the average cost of treatment for each disease, we still find that the relative health of the U.S. population does not account for the higher cost of health care. So what does? Let's consider the sources of the higher than expected spending. The single largest component of higher than expected spending is outpatient care, which includes physician and dentist office, same day visits to hospitals, including emergency departments, ambulatory surgery, and diagnostic imaging sector centers and other same day care facilities. These treatment settings alone count for $436 billion or two-thirds of the spending above what we would expect. The highest and fastest growing cost of outpatient care can partly be explained by an ongoing structural shift away from inpatient settings such as overnight hospital stays. Today, the U.S. system delivers 65 percent of all care in outpatient contexts, up from 43 percent in 1980 and well above the OECD average of 52 percent. In theory, this shift could and could help save money since fixed costs in outpatient settings tend to be lower than the cost of overnight hospital stays. In reality, however, the shift to outpatient care is added to rather than taken away from total systems costs as increases in care utilization in an outpatient setting have more than offset any potential cost benefits in inpatient settings. In addition to the structural change, there are several other factors that fuel this growth in outpatient care costs. For example, outpatient care is highly profitable. U.S. hospitals can earn a significant percentage of their profits from elective same-day care, which prompts investments in the facilities and the people supporting it. The significant degree of discretion that doctors have over the course and extent of patient, outpatient treatment also plays a role, as does the fee-for-service reimbursement system, which creates financial incentives to provide more outpatient care. We also find that technological innovation in these settings actually drives prices higher rather than lower in most industries because of the nature of the reimbursement system. Finally, there is no effective check on growth. We see that demand appears to grow in response to the greater availability of supply. In addition, the average patient is relatively insensitive to price given that his or her out-of-pocket expenses represent usually somewhere around 15 percent of the total cost of care. Other countries also have low out-of-pocket expenses but control supply to compensate for the lack of demand-side value consciousness. So outpatient care is $436 billion. The next largest contributors to extra spending in the United States are the cost of drugs, which is $98 billion more than we would expect for wealth, driven by 50 percent higher prices and the use of a more expensive mix. This price gap exists despite the fact that we use fewer branded drugs, use more generics, and pay less for generics that we do use than other countries.